top song of J. Alfred Prufrock is written in uh, the form of the interior monologue of a character whose name is Prufrock. And uh, Prufrock, in fact, is <coughs> presented by Eliot as a prototype of the modern man in his impotence, frustration, in his uh, hesitancy and inability to take action. Uh, even his name, uh, J. Alfred Prufrock, in fact, uh, is uh, contradictive. The first half is highly musical, lucid, and easy to say, while the second <coughs> half of the name, Prufrock, is uh, ugly and uh, discordant, harsh and discordant, almost uh, showing the sound of the engine or the, the machine. So even in his name, Prufrock sums up that uh, contrast or that, uh, in fact, a cleavage between the, the, the noble, beautiful past and the cheap, uh, mediocre present. The title also indicates that the poem is supposed to be a kind of love song. And um, a love song, of course, uh, in traditional literature is a poem which is connected with love, with euphoria, with happiness, with with some sort of perfect pastoral setting. So when we start reading the poem, we carry all those expectations in our minds. We uh, expect to find a love song, like the ones we have already been introduced to in Shakespeare or Marlowe or Petrarch. But once we start reading the poem, in fact, we'll be shocked to discover that, in fact, we don't have a traditional love song, but rather an ironical, uh, realization of the of the love song, because uh, Eliot's poem here shows the opposite of all what traditional love songs uh, presented. In fact, it is a drama of inaction, frustration, uh, misery, uh, impotence, in which nothing happens. In fact, the poem starts with nothingness, inaction, dejection, and it ends almost with the same thing. So the structure of the poem is uh, actually cyclical or spiral, as if uh, we start where we end and we end where we start. Just below the title, if you check the text, below the title we have uh, an epigraph. The poem starts therefore with an, epi with an epigraph. Eliot always furnishes his, poem, his poems with uh, epigraphs, which he chooses very carefully in which he intends to uh, direct the reading of the whole poem. So the epigraph in Iliad, in fact, uh, furnishes an, inter an intertextual framework which uh, creates a perspective within which we can read the whole poem. So the whole meaning of the poem is shaped by the epigraph. The epigraph to this poem is taken from Dante's The Divine Comedy. And exactly it is taken from the first part in that uh, poem, uh, which is called the Inferno. Of course, in this poem, uh, Dante is making a journey through the, th uh, the three realms of, the, of life after death. The journey starts, starts at the Inferno, Hell, and then it moves through the Purgatorio, and finally uh, reaching the, his final, I mean, uh, Dante reaches his final vision in the Paradiso guided by, uh, of course, by uh, Beatrice, his loved, his loved one. And just before he, uh, first he was guided by Virgil. And uh, at the last part, the Paradiso, he, he uh, starts to be guided by Beatrice. The speaker in the epigraph is Guido. And Guido is one of the dead whom uh, Dante meets in the Inferno. And he asks Guido about the reason for which uh, Guido has uh, been dumped in hell uh, or for which he is being tormented. The sin he committed in his life which uh, brought him such damnation. And Guido answers uh, Prophrock. So the epigraph depicts exa Guido's exact answer to to uh, Prophrock, uh, I mean to, to, to uh, Dante. Uh, Guido says to Dante, since I'm sure that, this is the translation 
of uh, the epigraph because the epigraph is not given in English. Uh, Eliot uh, uh, borrows the exact paragraph, the exact epigraph, and he gives the original quotation, which is not in English, as I said, but in some sort of Italian uh, variety, which is Tuscan. The translation of the epigraph uh, can be summed up this way. Guido says to Dante, since I am sure that you are not going to return to life again, because those who die will never return to, to life, therefore he says to him, I will tell you very freely, I will be very free in telling you all the sins and, and uh, evil things which I did in my life without shame, and which uh, I will tell you all these things uh, which in, in fact brought me this damnation. So then when we start reading the poem, we uh, expect to also to find a journey here. The poem, the whole poem is also a journey which is made by a prefrog. And this uh, reading of the poem, in fact, is suggested by the epigraph. The epigraph uh, makes us read the whole poem as a journey made by a prefrog rather than by Dante. And it also starts with a confession. The conversation now is between Prophrog and some other person who is not identified. The poem starts this way. Let's go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient at rise upon a table. So let's go. We, at the beginning of the poem, we also have an invitation, invitation to go on a journey. This is the the way that all traditional love songs start, actually. But here we have a dichotomy here of pronouns. Because we have you and I. Let's go then you and I. Of course, the I refers to Prefrog. Prefrog is the speaker here in this uh, in dramatic or interior monologue. But who, to whom is Prefrog speaking? It is not clear. And we don't know exactly what he means by you. Let's go then, you and I. The you here remains an enigma throughout, throughout the whole poem. It could be referring to the reader. And in this case, Prophrog is inviting the reader to, uh, to, to accompany him in this journey, which is in fact a, a journey not in, 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 in uh, geography. It is not a physical journey, not in, in place, but a mental journey. It is a journey of self-exploration, a journey into his own consciousness, his own self. And it is a journey of self-discovery, so to speak. So if uh, this is one interpretation, the, the you here could also be referring to um, the lady he, he, he loves, Prophrog loves. In this case, Prophrog is inviting his lady to accompany him in the journey. Exactly like what happens in traditional love songs. The shepherd or the lover always is daring and he is uh, inviting his lady to accompany him into uh, a journey. So this love song is also starts in the same way, but ironically, of course. A third uh, interpretation of the, these pronouns or this pronouns dichotomy um, maybe which with which I very powerfully identify is that both the you and the I both the two pronouns stands for stand for Prophrog himself because Prophrog is a is a hesitant person he is self divided and therefore he part of himself is inviting the other part to go like a schizophrenic person he is like a person who is looking at himself in the mirror. And he is telling himself to go, but he never, uh, never goes. So, uh, um, this is, as I said, because of his hesitancy. Um, in fact, the poem is built on um, 
a short story by Henry James about a, wid a person, an aged person, who falls in love with a girl or a woman who is younger than him. And every day he uh, decides to, he plans to tell her about his love. But because he's hesitant and frustrated, he always postpones this uh, date or this time till another till tomorrow and he is trapped in this process of endless procrastination every day he he prefers and he postpones the the, the uh, this decision and in fact he the, the story ends and he never tells her about his love so let's go then you and i when the evening spread out against the sky all our expectations of finding another tradition love song happy and euphoric are shattered here because of this startling ugly image and instead of having a beautiful romantic image the poem starts with a, a highly conceited metaphysical image because here the time of the journey is the evening the dull melancholic wet evening and the poet compares this evening to a dead person at her eyes on a table waiting for some sort of surgery. So this uh, metaphor or this image in fact is uh, highly far-fetched, highly conceited. It, is, it needs a reader who is uh, witty and smart to discover in what way is the evening like a sick person authorized on a table waiting for a surgery. Of course, the, the, this image establishes a, a, a sense of dullness, a sense of melancholy, fear, and inertia. And this is uh, the way that a person as, as such a condition feels waiting for a surgery. So this is a dull time which is not suitable for a love song and we realize here very quickly that in fact we have an ironical realization of the love song. Okay, let's go through certain half deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Here the poet repeats the invitation uh, for the second time. Let's go again and the very repetition here indicates that he's hesitant. Again, the, the uh, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent. The, here we have a description of the setting of the journey. After he describes the time, he describes here the setting of the journey. And the setting of the journey is through the streets of the city, London, which are uh, desolate and half deserted, and dirty. It is a journey which is connect, connected with retreats uh, rather than with... with with, uh, I mean, uh, courage. And uh, it is also connected with restless nights, with insomnia, with ugly, cheap hotels, with restaurants which are compared to, which are described as sodas restaurants, and which includes oyster shells inside them. We have another example of the conceit here because uh, the restaurants are compared to sawdust. You know, again, this is another image which is, like all can see, op 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 opaque, ambiguous, and very difficult to understand. And it needs the reader to think deeply to discover the, 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 the uh, underlying uh, sense of resemblance between sawdust and restaurants. Of course, the effect here is to say that these restaurants are uh, very small and scattered throughout all the city. The rooms in these restaurants are lankened to oyster shells uh, because the people in these uh, in this hotel, in these hotels, are though living together, but they are lonely. Each one is living in his own room, in his own cocoon of fears, illusions, and frustrations. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent. We have another conceit here uh, because he compares the streets, 
these streets are long, are long boring, and desolate. They are like an argument which is tedious and sterile. To lead you to an overwhelming question, if you, if we, he says, if we take the, these, uh, the journey through these uh, streets, then it will lead us to a kind of question. And it is a question which is overwhelming. Overwhelming means serious and difficult and uh, appalling question. Oh, do not ask what is it. Let us go and make our visit. You see, uh, still we have this this kind of self, uh, uh, this kind of uh, inner conversation, as if self dialogue, as if we have a dialogue between the two uh, selves of of uh, Profrock of his ego, as we said at the beginning. Part of him is willing to go, the other part is hesitant, is not willing to go. So part of him asks the other part, say, says to the other part, don't ask what is it, let us, only let us go and make our visit. As if part of him is trying to encourage the other part, the hesitant part, to go in that journey. And here uh, the poet repeats the, the, the invitation, lots, uh, indicated through lots for the third time. And the very repetition of let's go here indicates hesitancy and frustration. He keeps telling himself, Let's go, let's go, let's go. But he never goes, actually. Language here loses its significance as a means of communication and it becomes nothing more, nothing but a meaningless bubble, in fact. So then, this is the way the poem starts. It's a journey. And through desolate streets, at dull, melancholic evening and you can imagine what's uh, what uh, such kind of evening and uh, such kind of journey to what can such a kind of to what end can such a, a kind of journey lead us I uh, must say here that the word of overwhelming question here uh, indicates an allusion to Hamlet's famous soliloquy to be or not to be that is the question here of course, uh, Prof. Uh, Eliot doesn't say, he doesn't mention Hamlet or Shakespeare here, but uh, he, he, he alludes, that's to say he suggests, or he, give, he gives us a kind of clue through suggestiveness, suggestively, he gives us a kind of a clue, and he echoes, we call this echoing, he doesn't mention frankly or explicitly, but he indirectly echoes Hamlet's soliloquy of to be or not to be. So Prophroch's question, as compared with that of Hamlet, is trivial. Hamlet maybe has the right to be hesitant because his question is overwhelming, an overwhelming task. But what is Prophroch's question? Prophroch's question is, no, is nothing than um, his, uh, ability, his uh, decision or his plan to go, to take the journey, and the journey here is, is to the place where the woman he loves is sitting, waiting for him, maybe. And this is journey here. It is nothing than going to her and telling her about his love. But as I said, because he's hesitant, he, he, he uh, keeps uh, postponing this decision. And uh, in fact, he uh, magnifies this ordinary uh, everyday life situation into a kind of, and he sees it as, as if it is a kind of uh, da, uh, overwhelming task so to speak in the room the woman come and go talking of Michelangelo this couple of lines is repeated in fact throughout the poem as a kind of refrain because we said that this is a love song and for every love song there must be a refrain so this is the refrain for Prophroch's love song. In the room, the woman come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The reference here is to the room when his lady, the lady he loves, is sitting with a group of women, gossiping, they are gossiping about whom? They are gossiping about Michelangelo. Who is Michelangelo? Michelangelo is, as you know, a famous sculptor and painter at the time, at, uh, at the time of the Renaissance in Italy, 
So he's one of the heroes of the Renaissance, one of the, one of the champions of the Renaissance. As a frog here, uh, because he is uh, self-conscious, he is uh, obsessively conscious of his triviality and his uh, impotence, his dull personality, he uh, compares himself with great figures. From now on, he will keep comparing himself with great figures and heroes in the history of humanity. And uh, those, of course, uh, uh, heroes make him, the very mention of those heroes remind him uh, of his uh, triviality and of his, in fact, impotence. As if he wants, to, he, he starts here making an excuse or fabricating an excuse for his uh, procrastination, for his timidity, by saying that those women are talking, are fascinated by such a great man like Michael Onslow. So are they going to take any heed of me? Profrock, the dull, um, uh, frustrated, and disintegrated, disintegrated, uh, dull, modern man. So from now on, Profrock will be in, in, involved in this kind of, in fact, uh, 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 self-dialogue and in this kind of uh, argument of the question. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pool that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. Here, Eliot refers to um, the fog and the smoke, which are elements of the setting, of course, and which are byproducts of modern industrialism and urban life. Yet the way he describes fog and smoke here uh, suggests a kind of animal. Look at mentioning the word, because smoke is, is described, uh, uh, said to behave like an animal. It rubs its uh, back upon the window panes, it rubs its muzzle on the window panes, it licks its tongue, it lingers in the pools of stagnant water, it uh, has a suit in, it has a, a, a shower in the suit from the chimneys, it slips by the terrace and then it makes a sudden leap and curls itself and falls asleep. So when you, this description is as if uh, in the case or uh, alludes to or suggest a cat or a dog maybe doing like that. And such an image again indicates um, dullness, inertia and lethargy. It is not of course the fog and the smoke which behaves like that. It is Prufrog himself who sees uh, his uh, environment in this way. In psychology we call this projection. A happy person will see all people and everything around him in happy terms. But a frustrated, unhappy person will project his sense of gloom and uh, in fact uh, melancholy on uh, all his surroundings, so to speak. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street rubbing its back upon the window panes there will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. Look at the repetition here. Profrock, as I said, starts fabricating excuses for his timidity <coughs> and for his proc procrastination. <coughs> here he says that there is no need to be in a hurry. Before I take such a decision, I have to be very careful and I should turn it over and I should make sure that I would not be rejected or mocked at by the, that woman, maybe. Therefore, he says, there will be much time. And this phrase, there will be time, there will be time, will be repeated many times throughout the whole poem. Uh, hence, he makes it a kind of motif. In fact, the whole poem, you are going to see, is a medley of 
or a collage of symbols, illusions, images, motifs which are made to echo forward and backward and backward and forward in a symphonic effect, hence creating a kind of music, inner music, which Eliot called the music of ideas. Uh, um, like at the beginning of the poem, for example, we have the reference to the evening motif. The evening and will be repeated throughout the whole poem. Like the reference to the oyster shells, or sea imagery, or sea creatures. And again, sea imagery will be repeated throughout the whole poem. The whole poem. The abolum in question, the word question will be also repeated, hence being transformed into a motif. The pronouns, the academy, also is another motif. The yellow and fog and smoke. Um, animal imagery, the cat and other animal imagery. So all these are in fact motifs which uh, give the poem a kind of cadence. Now, there will be time, he says, to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create. Of course, Prophet is not going to murder anybody, nor is he going to create. But because he's hesitant, he equates his dull, trivial issue or affair with that woman to the great uh, tasks of murdering and creation. Yes, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Pay attention to these two lines. And time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. In this couple of lines, we have another illusion, uh, which is not direct illusion. Of course, we have two kinds of illusion in Eliot. The first one is direct illusion, in which we have an explicit mention of some previous work or some previous author, dead author. And he, at the end of the poem, when he says, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. Here, there is, we have, for example, a direct mentioning or explicit reference to Hamlet. And this uh, kind of illusion is very easy to identify because it is explicit, as I said. But the, the, the second type of illusion is the echo illusion. Here, we don't have a reference, a, an implicit reference, but rather we have a covert or an implicit, a deep uh, uh, clue which echoes some previous author or some other text. If you remember at the beginning, we said, Eliot said that a text, he defined a text by saying that a text is a mosaic of other texts. And when you read the love song of J. L. Brock, you will discover that, in fact, it is a mosaic of a wide range of texts that Eliot read and assimilated. And these texts are referred to or echoed uh, mainly in an indirect way, in this way. So back to the two uh, lines. There will be time, uh, uh, not this, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Here we have an allusion to John the Baptist. In the whole Quran, he is called Yahya bin Zakaria. Don't, we have in these two lines a, a, a reference to, do, to John the Baptist. Of course, there is nothing, no mention, direct mention of John the Baptist in these two lines. So how do we know that we have an allusion to, do, to John the Baptist? It is through the hands. He says, in reference to the hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Here we have a clue which makes us compare this or recollect the story of John the Baptist, John the Baptist, whose head was was uh, cut off by Herod, the king of the Jews, who cut uh, John uh, John's head and presented it on a golden dish to uh, a Jewish dancer. And it is said that the king used to lift and drop the sacred head of Yahya bin Zakaria on that plate or golden plate. So the word hands, that lift and drop, and the word plate, meaning dish, naam, these two words yani make, uh, make us, makes, uh, makes, make us associate this with John the Baptist. 
also the, the, we have another allusion in, the, in, this, in these two lines, the reference to works and days. Uh, in fact, uh, this is a title, Works and Days is the title of uh, a book by Hesiod, a historian, who uh, in that book he uh, talked about serious issues like necessity of work, like freedom, like uh, equality, and like uh, uh, culture, etc., great tasks which are needed for the welfare of humanity. So as if here, Prof. Rock is comparing his trivial works and days to the great works and days of Hesiod. You see? Okay, time for you and time for me. You and me. The dichotomy of pronouns goes on here. And time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. Again, there the time motif here. He says there is no need to be in a hurry. Uh, we have, uh, well, I have a great deal of time, and I can take my time over it. I can turn it over. He says to make sure that I wouldn't be rejected or made fun of by those women before the taking of a toast or tea. Before uh, we take toast and tea, I mean, before he sits with that woman, and before they start taking toast and tea. He says, I will have much time to uh, make hundreds of indecisions and hundreds of uh, visions and revisions. Imagine how hesitant and how disintegrated this person is. In the room, the woman come and go talking of Michelangelo. Again, here we have a repetition of uh, the refrain. We are reminded of the room, which is the target of the journey and which... Uh, uh, becomes a kind of obsession to to Prof. Rock. 